Hey there, Facebook fam, and those of you watching after the fact on YouTube, we're glad you are joining us for Porch Worship. We are excited to be in a new place this week with some new visitors as well. The Rices have opened up their porch to us, and we are so grateful uh, to be able to be here, grateful for the hospitality, letting us be here. It's been exciting for me to see this house that I had only seen in pictures on Facebook before, too, so uh, pretty cool. And uh, I have with me uh, our worship intern for the summer, Katie Bertrand, and we're so grateful to have her with us as well. You'll get to meet her more this week uh, on Wednesday when we do our, our Wednesday uh, midweek encouragement as well. So would love uh, for you to join us for that so that you can find out a little bit more about Katie. Uh, as we get started and rolling into this time, whether you're watching us live or whether you're watching after the fact, there is uh, some uh, children's activities online that uh, I think they'll, we'll put them in the, in the comment section of this video so you can click over on that. And so if you've got kids that you're trying to watch with, uh, then you can send them to do some of those activities on an iPad or a laptop or something. So uh, anyway, uh, glad that you are with us, and thanks for joining us, and we're going to get started. King. 
empty place and treasures that fade are never enough. And then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied.
us in prayer um, before John shares his message. So while you're home, if you would bow your heads and pray with me. Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity to still be able to worship and praise your name um, in a time that can be so confusing and we don't know what the next day holds, Lord. We know in your word that um, you say to rejoice in hope, to be patient in tribulation, and to be constant in prayer. And Lord, I just pray that you give us a posture of childlike prayer today as John shares his message, Lord. I pray that you help us to be patient in this tribulation when we're not sure what's coming next, um, but that you can teach us how to rebuild our lives with you in the center of it through prayer, God. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. So we as a people, as a nation, we like our safety. And um, I think that's kind of apparent if you look around and you see some of the things that we do as a nation. We, a study in 2019 actually revealed that, that many Americans um, are, are really d feeling um, insecure and unsafe. And, and actually, in that study that they did in 2019, it was found that 22% um, of people who don't feel safe are most concerned about a property crime. So either your house being broken into or your car broken into or something like that, uh, that will make you feel unsafe. Um, in fact, some people may, maybe you watching, actually have the Ring doorbell. And the makers of the Ring doorbell, they they advertise their doorbell by saying you can answer the door and check in on home at any time from anywhere. And so that idea of making sure that, that your, your home, your property is always secure is something that's near and dear to our hearts as people, especially as Americans. And so what happens when that safety is compromised? What do we do when we find ourselves feeling somewhat uns unsafe somewhat insecure. Well, we have been looking over the last couple of weeks uh, at Women of the Bible. We finished that series up last week, and this week we're going into a, a new series, and, and it's actually a, a time that's 
uh, right after some of the stories that we've looked at in the past couple weeks. We had been looking at what we call the exilic period of history, which was when the people of God were in exile. And now we're looking at a book over the next few weeks called Nehemiah, which happens post-exile. So after the exile, as people are beginning to come back to their home, as they're coming from all the places where God had scattered them, um, they're, uh, they're actually, that's where our story begins is looking at that and so over these next couple weeks we're going to be considering this idea of rebuilding because that's what happens within the text that we're looking at over these few weeks you see in ancient cities the wall was the thing that that provided protection for the people and jerusalem which was the city of of god's people and the city of god after the people had been in exile for a long period of time when they started coming back after the 70 years, they they found that it wasn't secure. It, it's like, a, imagine abandoning your house for a long period of time and coming back to it and realizing that, you know, critters had somehow made their home inside your house and, and maybe some of the windows uh, were broken or, or other things and, and you wouldn't necessarily feel safe. In ancient cities, the wall around the city was the thing that protected them. And so if that wall was broken, they would feel insecure. They would feel unprotected. And so uh, that's what happens. Um, that's what happened for the people of God. They found themselves in this vulnerable situation where they just didn't know what to do. Um, and, and I wonder, as we spend time uh, into this, looking at this idea of rebuilding, looking at even this idea of vulnerability with a wall that's broken down, some, we're going to be asking ourselves some questions about that. Not just looking at Nehemiah and his story and the people of God and their story, but also relating it to us and saying, well, what happens when we feel insecure? What happens when we don't feel safe? And what are the things in our lives that maybe have broken down somewhat uh, that we need to rebuild? You know, think about if you kind of analyze your life and you think about things that you might need to rebuild. Like maybe you're at a place where you've experienced sickness and you've been sidelined for a long period of time and, and now you're trying to come back again. I think all of us in some ways feel like we're rebuilding from COVID-19, that we're trying to figure out a way back from having been sidelined from the world in some ways. And so uh, maybe COVID-19 is your thing. Maybe you've experienced a relational uh, brokenness or you've experienced a divorce in your life or something else where you're all of a sudden trying to figure out how do I put the pieces back together again? How do I rebuild my life from this? And my hope and my prayer as we walk through this series is that no matter where you are, no matter what kind of rebuilding you're doing in your life or maybe God's doing in your life, uh, that you'll learn some things along the way that you can apply so that the rebuilding process maybe won't be as painful um, as it could be uh, because there are some things that you're learning about it as we go. So, you know, one thing about rebuilding is that I, it takes time. Um, you know, even thinking about being here uh, on the porch of this house, I've, I've watched through pictures how, how Jarrett and Jen have built this house together and watch these pieces come together. And I know that it was a grueling process for them. They poured blood, sweat, and tears into that. And I think about the fact that building isn't always comfortable. It's not always something that comes easy. Sometimes it requires sacrifice and rebuilding is the same way. In fact, sometimes the process of rebuilding, it actually requires us to tear some things down as well that we might have to tear down some other structures that once stood there that maybe aren't quite uh, as, as strong or reliable as they once were. We've got to tear that down in order for something better to be built in this place. And so this rebuilding process, it, it's a journey. And hopefully as we walk on this, as we look at what Nehemiah learned in his rebuilding process, uh, we can apply that to our lives as well. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to 
the book of Nehemiah comes right after the book of Ezra and right before the book of Esther, which we had looked at a few weeks ago. So Nehemiah chapter 1, we're and the first few verses talk kind of about what uh, I, the introduction that I've given, um, that Nehemiah got word that Jerusalem was in disrepair. And, um, and so we start in verse 4 of Nehemiah chapter 1, seeing that Nehemiah's already gotten this information. He's already gotten news uh, of the state of disrepair of the wall around the city of Jerusalem. And so starting in verse 4, in Nehemiah chapter 1, this is what we read. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly toward you. We've not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, even your exiled people are at the far even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I'll gather them from there, bring them to the place I've chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. That last phrase there, I was cupbearer to the king, it just represents what Nehemiah's role was at the time. And he had a fairly um, responsible position that anything that would pass the lips of the king would go past him first. And so there was major trust there. And so... Nehemiah eventually uses that, and we'll see that in upcoming weeks, um, uses that to his advantage, the fact that he is trusted. But here we see that Nehemiah has gotten this news, and, and before he starts planning, before he starts doing anything else, one of the first things that he does is he grieves and mourns. And so the idea of rebuilding in our lives you know, I think we as, as Americans, we can be really efficient people. We like to see if we can multitask. We like to see if we can get a lot of things done all at the same time. And so, but I think Nehemiah gives us a picture here that sometimes we've got to stop. Before rebuilding happens, th there's a time for grief. There's a time of just stopping and, and realizing what we've lost. And so, again, I don't know where you are today in regards to a something in your life that you might need to rebuild. But I think one of the first places that all of us need to start is just grieving what we lost. That if we're rebuilding something, there's been some amount, some kind of loss that we've experienced. And it's really important for us to stop and, and to just grieve what it is that we've lost. Now, you know, Grieving is different for everybody. We don't always know. I can't necessarily say, okay, do that for you know three days and then you know move on. Uh, we don't necessarily want to wallow in our grief, but at the same time, we don't want to move past it quickly. And and Nehemiah here, he stopped and for days he mourned and he pr fasted and he prayed. And that's the second thing Nehemiah did. Not only did he mourn and grieve the loss that had been experienced and what his fellow countrymen were experiencing, but uh, he also um, stopped to fast and pray. That, that Nehemiah, before he was going to do anything else, he stopped and went right to God. And so again, if you're in a time of rebuilding in your life, have you stopped to talk to God about it? Have you stood or sat or kneeled or laid before the Lord and said, 
God, before I do anything else, before I start this process of rebuilding, I, I need to stand before you. I need to be before you. And, and Jeremiah, I mean, Nehemiah does that. He stops and he acknowledges who God is. You know, every good prayer I think that we see in the Bible, we see that when we come, when we approach God, we approach him as he is. Um, as the, the one who's created all things, the one who's loved us enough to, to send his son Jesus to us. You know, if you're a parent, then maybe you uh, have experienced this with your kids when it comes to the posture that they take when they ask you for something. You know, I know with my own three kids, I'm, I'm going to react very differently when they ask me something dependent on how they're asking me. If my kids come to me and they say, hey, dad, you need to give me $50 because I want this, uh, chances of my response being favorable and positive is pretty low because the posture that they're coming with is almost like this posture of entitlement. But if my kids say, hey, dad, you know, I want to find a way that I can work to, to get this $50 because I want this. Do you think you can help me out? Or is there any way that you and mom could help us do this it's such a different ask and, and I think just like we as earthly parents we we want our children to approach us we don't want them necessarily to grovel in front of us but we want them to come with a posture of thankfulness of gratitude when they come to us and say hey I appreciate all that you've done for me and now I don't know that my eight-year-old is necessarily gonna say that to me right but um, but I think are we training up our kids in that? And are we following that ourselves when we go to our Heavenly Father? And when we ask Him for things, are we taking this posture of like, all right, let me just lay this out, God, now, now bring it to me? Or am I coming with this posture of gratitude and thankfulness? And that's what, that's what Nehemiah does. He, he starts there and he, he talks about who God is, that He's an awesome God who keeps His covenant. And the next place that Nehemiah goes in his prayer is, is to confession, that Nehemiah confesses sins. And there's two things to think about here. First of all, um, we as the branch are not necessarily a, a church that every week we, we stop to do confession in the midst of our services. Churches that are, are more formal sometimes, churches that are, have more of a, a liturgy that they follow, they'll take time for confession within their corporate time together. Hopefully we as individuals are taking time to confess before the Lord the things, our shortcomings, our sins, the things that we've done. And that's what Nehemiah does here. And so um, wherever we do confession, it's, it's important. It's something that we need to embrace, something that we need to do. Now, not just the act of confession, but what it is are, that we're confessing is important. And, and here we see in Nehemiah something that I think is really applicable for us today. Because if you look at what Nehemiah is confessing, he's confessing, uh, in verse 6 we see it, the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. Now, what were the sins that the Israelites had committed against God? Well, they hadn't followed his commandments. They hadn't kept the covenant that they had made with him. And God had told them that if you don't, then I will scatter you. And that's exactly what they're seeing here is the fallout of that. And now that they're beginning to return to God, the people are beginning to return from their exile as well. But the thing about Nehemiah's prayer is that Nehemiah was not necessarily the person who had committed those sins personally. That Nehemiah was maybe a baby or maybe he hadn't even been born yet when, when some of these sins had been committed. And yet he's still willing to confess those before the Lord. There's something to be said about realizing that there are times in our lives, and I think we see this right now in our own history, 
that there are things that we may not feel like we are responsible for. We might not even feel like um, our fathers or grandfathers or others were responsible, but uh, if we really followed it back, we might find that along the way there were sins, and, and specifically sins against God. And you think about where we are as a country, that we're dealing with some major racial strife, and we're in desperate need of racial reconciliation. And one of the things that I think is important is that we realize that um, anytime that there's anything uh, that stands in the way uh, of us acknowledging the image of God created in somebody else, um, that that's a sin against God. And so we might say that, well, you know, racism is a sin, that it's, it's just reserved for a specific race. Well, if we don't love people as God created them, then we're sinning not just against those people, but we're sinning against God. And I think Nehemiah comes to this place where he realized that his ancestors had sinned. And I think we need to come to that place, too, where we realize that, hey, you know what? Like, we're part of this. And maybe we need to, to confess as well. We've seen this happen uh, a few times. We saw this a few weeks back when we took that pause in our Women of, of the Bible series to look at Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9. Daniel did a similar thing with confession that he stopped, he confessed the sins of his ancestors, and then he moved on um, after that. You know, the thing about confession... The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9 that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That we need to remember that when we come before God and confess, we don't need to keep confessing that over and over and over again. Um, that there may still be consequences that linger because of what it is that we're confessing, but when we confess before God, uh, he forgives us and he doesn't keep reminding us of that. Um, that that confession is a once for all confession that we need to remember. And God um, gives back what he promised to. That's where Nehemiah comes to as well. That, you know, when we sin, there are consequences to our actions. And when we make covenants, when we make promises with someone else, there's going to be a, a promise that for something that happens when we follow that, and there's going to be a promise or something that happens when we don't follow that. And God had told them that if they ran from him, if they, if they didn't follow him, that they would be scattered. But because um, they've been following him, obeying his commands again, God's bringing them back. And that's what we see in verse 9. If you return to me and obey my commands, God said, then um, I, even your exiled people will come back. And that's what they're seeing. And so we need to remember that we serve a God who is gracious. God doesn't want to punish us and keep punishing us over and over again. He keeps his promises to us. And so we need to remember that when we confess before him, when we follow his commands, he brings us back, just like the people of God were brought back. Nehemiah ends his prayer with a big ask. And he, he says that um, he wants to find success and favor in the eyes and in the presence of this man who, who was the king that he served. It's not bad for us to ask God for things. That's kind of what prayer is, or that's a part of, of prayer. When we go before the Lord, uh, we need to lay down our requests before him. And that's what Nehemiah does. He's very specific. Nehemiah knows that there's going to be a plan in place, but in order to get that plan in place, he needs to get permission from the king, this king that he's serving. And so his big ask to God is that, that God would grant him favor in the presence of this man. You know, that that big ask is something that we probably all come to. And again, if you're thinking about your own life, that rebuilding uh, whatever it is in your life, like what's the big ask for you? 
Like whose favor do you need as you begin to rebuild? You know, is it somebody else? Um, is, it, is it because you've got relational strife and you need to find favor with somebody who maybe you've hurt before? What is it that, that you need favor in in order for you to move forward? Don't be afraid to ask God for that specifically. He, he already knows, but how, you know, we know what our children want too, right? Those of us who are parents. And yet, how good is it and when we hear them ask? Um, because we know that they know what they need as well. And so um, God wants to hear our hearts. He wants to hear what it is that we want. What are the things that we're asking for? You know, Nehemiah ends with that phrase, I was cupbearer to the king, that, that Nehemiah had a position. But, you know, it's interesting that that's the last thing that's mentioned here. Nehemiah doesn't go before God right away and say, hey, God, you know, I'm cupbearer to the king, so I expect that you're going to use that role to make things happen because look how wonderful I am. No, Nehemiah saves that until the very end because I think Nehemiah realizes that the only reason he has that role, the only reason why he's cupbearer to the king is because God's allowed that to happen. God's given him that position. And so as we come to these places in our lives where we need to rebuild, it could be really easy for us to say, well, look at this position that I have. Look at this power that I have. Look at this authority or this status or, or whatever it is that I have. But we need to remember, just like Nehemiah, that that's the, the last thing that we need to mention because it's the first thing that we mention and who God is what he's done for us that allows us to come to that last place that place of realizing that God's given us the privilege to hold these powers and these positions and and the status that we have and do we take time to thank God for that do we take time in humility and uh, gratitude to say you know what God you've allowed me to have this all that I have and part of maybe what's going to get me through this time of rebuilding is what God's given me, but we need to acknowledge that he's the one who's given it to us. And then we move on from there. Do we really believe that? Do we believe that it's God who's given us these, these positions, uh, these, the status that we have? If we do, then we need to acknowledge him as the giver of the gift who's allowed us to do this and then praise him for that and then trust him that he has set things up he's ordered things in such a way um, that we can find favor with those that we need to find favor with as we go about rebuilding in our lives and so yeah we're going to talk a lot about this idea of rebuilding and and like i said it might be uncomfortable there might be times where we just feel like you know what like it's not easy to rebuild. Sometimes we just want to, you know, abandon things. If you drive down the road and in, in where, where I live, there are some times that I see empty and abandoned houses on the side of the road because it was just easier to walk away. And it's possible that you're going to come to that place where you're just going to want to walk away. You're going to want to abandon the house and say, you know, it's just not worth it. But I assure you that if you take time to really think about it, to lay it before God, to take the same posture that Nehemiah took, that that rebuilding process, though it might be painful and it will be difficult, that God will be with you throughout. And that's what we're going to see as we go through this series. And so what are some of the other things that we can do with this? As we think about Nehemiah and we kind of move forward in context to where we are today. Again, I think there's some questions that we can ask ourselves. And the first one's this. What is it in your life that you feel like needs rebuilding? Just ask yourself that. Even write it down if you need to. And sometimes writing things down or speaking things out gives it a sense of reality that might not be felt if we kind of keep it hidden and secret. 
And so whatever it is that you feel like God's saying, you need to rebuild this. Write it down. Speak it. Speak it to a friend, a trusted friend. Speak it to God in prayer. Write it in a prayer journal, whatever it is. But just acknowledge that you understand what it is that God is wanting to rebuild in your life. And then ask yourself, how are you starting the rebuilding process? Um, as you look at what it is that needs to be rebuilt, ask yourself too, is there something that needs to be knocked down? Um, and prepare yourself for that. Because like I said, that could be painful. Um, but if you're prepared for the knocking down, then maybe it won't be as painful than if somebody just kind of went through uh, with an excavator and, and, and knocked it down. So ask yourself um, what it is that might need to be knocked down in order for rebuilding to happen. Um, and, and then how are you starting with in prayer? Are you going before God and starting first with him and saying, God, can you show me the plan here? Can you show me which direction to go? It's really easy for us. It's really easy for me. As, as a former engineer to go through and say, oh, I've got it all figured out. I've got everything laid out. I've got plans. And then say to God, hey, look, I've figured out where I'm going. Here's where I'm going. Now will you make it happen? Rather than saying to him, before I lay pen or pencil to paper, say, God, what is it that you would have me do? What is the plan for rebuilding in my life? Can you give it to me rather than me giving it to you? Because I can assure you that if we take our plans and say to God, um, here, bless this, like he's probably just going to laugh at us. <laughs> so uh, we need to be really careful that we ask him for those plans before submitting plans to him um, that came right from us. So my prayer for myself, my prayer for all of us through this series is that God will rebuild some cool stuff in us. Um, that we'll start to see it as individuals, we'll start to see it as communities and towns, we'll start to see it as states, we'll start to see it as a country. And I, I promise you, as much as we want to see our, our country move out of some of the things that we're in, I don't really think that we can do that until um, the church begins to show that the only way for us to rebuild is rebuilding on the one foundation of Jesus Christ that will hold it. Um, we can keep trying to rebuild uh, on other things, but I think they're going to break down every time. But we can't expect people who don't know or acknowledge who Jesus is to try to build that way. And so I think the responsibility of his church, of the church, of us church, is to really represent that and be an example of what it means to rebuild in a godly way. And so that's my prayer for you, for me, for all of us together. So let's pray right now. God, thank you for Nehemiah. Thank you for this account that we have to go back to. And even though it happened years ago, Father, we can still learn from his example. And I pray, God, that as we come to place in places in our own lives where we need to rebuild, that you would show us the way. You'd help us to have the right posture. You would help us um, to have the right attitude and to remember who you are, that you are the giver of gifts who allows us to be able to rebuild the things in our lives that need rebuilding. So thank you, God. We look forward to this as painful as it might be. Um, we trust you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. We have some things within our community that we're pushing for and pushing into. Um, we have been blessed as the branch to uh, continue to do things, uh, even in the midst of, of quarantining and other things. And as things begin to open up, hopefully we'll have even more opportunities. We say at the branch often that partnership is key and we know that the first and foremost partnership that we need is with God um, he is the vine we are the branches and if we remain in him then he will remain in us and so that's the first partnership that we need to think about we also need to think about partnering with one another 
and then uh, not just partnering together as a community or a faith community, but partnering into the neighborhood, into the community around us. There are some opportunities that we'll have coming up. In fact, one on July 11th, uh, one of our community partners is uh, Hanover County Schools and specifically Gandhi Elementary School. We've developed a partnership with them and relationships with them. And so we're looking forward to being able to bless Gandhi by doing some work to their, their planting beds outside. So on July 11th, we're gonna plan on taking the morning from 9 a.m. to noon to start working on those planting beds. If you haven't joined our Now Serving page on Facebook, we encourage you to do that so you can get more information. As more details start emerging about that, which is actually not as far away as you might think, um, then just check our Facebook page, check that Now Serving page for more details about that. Tomorrow we have a book discussion group that's starting both virtually and in person. So uh, we would love for you to join us as we talk through the book Strong and Weak by Andy Crouch. Uh, we're going to be having three different sessions for that, uh, one tomorrow, one in July, and then one in August as well as we take that book in thirds and then just really start talking about it, unpacking it, seeing uh, what we can learn from it as we consider this idea of vulnerability and authority that Crouch talks about within that book and how we hold those things in tension at the same time. So we'd love for you to join us for that. It's not too late. Just go on our Facebook page and you can uh, join the, the group discussion about that. We're doing our Bible study, our men's Bible study virtually. We've moved it to Wednesday mornings at 6.30 a.m. We're doing it both in person and virtually. We're trying to have a hybrid approach because we know that some of you still want to make sure that you're staying safe and you're staying home. You don't want to be around crowds. Um, so that's completely understandable. We're doing our best to make sure that everything's cleaned as well. So uh, if you feel comfortable coming into the space, we'd love to have you. If you want to keep it virtual, that's fine too. So 6.30 a.m. and if you want a link for that, you can just send us a private message. We'd love for you to follow us on Facebook or Instagram. And then again, these messages are going up on YouTube as well. On Wednesday, you can join us at noon for our Facebook Live event, our midweek encouragement. And this week, we're gonna, I'm gonna have a more formal introduction of Katie, who's with us for the summer. So we'd love for you to join us at noon on Wednesday for that as well. Thanks for joining us. Uh, whether you're watching live or whether you're watching after the fact, I'm grateful that you took the time to be here and to just listen, to be part of what God is doing at the branch. We're so grateful for what God is doing. We're grateful for all the many ways that we've seen him already in just the short time that we've been in existence. And we look forward to how God is going to continue to work. If you'd like to be part of that, if you'd like to partner with us financially, there are different ways that you can give. Uh, those are available and will probably be in the comment section of this. You can give to us via Venmo. You can give to us via a website called Tithely and where there's a link on our website and then our address is also available on our website and our Facebook page. We uh, know that we can't do what we do without partnership from others. And so thank you. Thanks for uh, your partnership with us. As you go out this week and you consider what it is that God's asking you to rebuild, remember that you're not doing it alone. Remember that he is with you. And so as we go off into the world, off into the lives that we live, uh, Monday through Saturday, May we go with the authority of the Father. May we go with the power of the Holy Spirit. And may we go in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Thanks again to the Rices for letting us be here on their porch. And we'll see you again next week.